This morning, Jesus redefining greatness. We're going to look to see how Jesus redefines greatness. Greatness is something that I think is in the human heart. God's put in your heart a desire to not only be around greatness and celebrate greatness, but to experience greatness yourself. And we're going to see this morning how Jesus um, redefines greatness for us and reorients our life towards greatness. We'll start in verse 1 of chapter 22. Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus for they were afraid of the people. A lot of context there. We'll cover it quickly if you're new to the story. Jesus has been living and teaching. He's been living for 33 years, teaching for three years is a public ministry. He's been healing the sick and raising the dead and, and, and turning uh, you know, uh, a little loaf of fish into a massive banquet for a huge crowd. I mean, he, he's, like, he's like a walking taco truck. He can just turn anything into food. I mean, it's, and it's drawn a crowd. Like, this guy's pretty cool. He's teaching and he's proclaiming the gospel and he's saying, I'm the son of God. I'm the fulfillment of the messianic promise. And it has disturbed some of the religious establishment. So now he's in Jerusalem, and he is there resolutely moving toward the cross. He knows he's going to die. He knows he's going to give his life up on the cross for the sins of the world. And he's trying to leave, like, breadcrumb trails for his apostles to help and disciples to help them see that he is the messianic fulfillment of all the promises uh, in the Old Testament. They're, they're coming to a climax and culmination in his life and death and soon resurrection. In so doing, he's disrupting the religious establishment, and they got a major problem with him, so they've been trying to kill him last several chapters. They've been asking him tricky questions and trying to corner him and, 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 and hang him up, and he's avoiding them like an expert swordsman, just parrying, parrying, parrying without even breaking a sweat. And now he's in Jerusalem, and it's the Passover, and the Passover's a big deal. So Jerusalem's population would have, would, have, would have doubled, potentially tripled, as people are coming from all over the place to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. The Passover, of course, is where they're remembering God's redemption and God's rescue and God's saving of, the, of Israel from Egyptian slavery. And if you remember, Israel was in uh, Egypt, and they were slaves, and they were like, God, why don't you hear our cry? Would you rescue us? And God said, I did hear your cry, and I will rescue. And he sends Moses to speak on behalf of, of God to Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh says no, and God then proceeds to beat Pharaoh to a bloody pulp with plague after plague after plague after plague. And rather than Pharaoh's heart getting soft, in humbling himself before the God who is obviously more mighty than him, his heart gets harder and harder and harder. No, 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 until the final plague is sent that will break Pharaoh, and it's the killing of his oldest firstborn child. And God says to Moses, tell the people to take a, a, a lamb, a sacrifice, a, a sacrificial lamb to slaughter it and take the blood of the lamb and to spread it over the doorpost of the house. And any household that has the blood of a lamb spread over the doorpost, the angel of death will pass by. Any household that does not have the blood of the lamb covered, covering the doorpost, I will go in and I will take from them the firstborn child. Pharaoh says, ah, that's witchcraft, that's stupid. Israel, because they fear God, humble themselves and obey God, God sends the angel of death, and all the firstborn in all the land are taken. And it breaks Pharaoh, and he's finally like, get out of my sight, I can't stand you to see you anymore, just, just seeing you reminds me of all that I've lost, get out of here. And he not only releases them and sets them free, God actually plunders Egypt without Israel firing a bullet, and he gives him a ton of his riches and resources and, and donkeys and animals and camels and food. And just get out of here. I don't want you coming back. They leave Egypt rejoicing in God's salvation. He set us free from bondage. He set us free from slavery. He set us free to go experience the promised land. And then they follow a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night as God actually himself leads them and directs them. No Google Maps necessary. No compass necessary. Just follow the big cloud that God sent. This is awesome. They get to the Red Sea. They're like, this is incredible. Beachside resort. Little cup, you know, glasses with, with, with uh, you know, umbrellas in it. This is really nice. And they're sipping their kind of fruity drink there. And they're like, we are so amazed at God's greatness. He's incredible. We love him. We're going to serve him all of our life. His deliverance is outstanding. And then Pharaoh has a change of heart, gets in his horse and a chariot, chases after them, crests the top of the ridge, looks down on them. They look up and they say, Moses, why did you lead us out here in the desert to die? And Moses is like, 
what? You know, that time of like emotional whiplash. It's like, man, I was like a hero this second. And like, bam. I mean, he's like, he's like, I didn't lead us out here. I was following the same cloud you were following. You know what I mean? It's like, I, we were all, look, there's the fire. Let's follow that. Like, we were all following God. Don't blame me. Blame him. Cry out to him. We're in trouble here. And God says, God, did you lead us out here to die? Which God says, no. And <sighs> blows on the water and <sighs> the Red Sea parts and Israel, people of Israel escape Pharaoh's hand across on dry land. Pharaoh's like, cool uh, land bridge. I'll try that. And he heads out into the water and God's like, yeah, not exactly. Water comes back and God in one act rescues Israel and destroys Israel's greatest enemy. That's what Jerusalem is celebrating this week. This is the Passover week where they're celebrating the deliverance of Almighty God from the hand of Pharaoh, the releasing from captivity and slavery into freedom and life. That's what's going on. So it's a big party. But there's a problem. With big parties, sometimes come big potential for problems. And there's just kind of some, some electricity in the air about this rumored king who's going to overthrow the, the sitting king by instituting a new kingdom. And, and whenever these religious services would take place, there was always some revolutionary guy trying to cause up an uprising and a stirring against the tyranny of Rome. And so there was always extra soldiers around to, you know, to stomp that down and to, and to put it out. And they're really concerned about Jesus because Jesus is not just a big hat, no cattle guy. Jesus can like deliver. He can like raise the dead. If you can raise the dead, eh, you're better than most guys claiming to be God. I mean, like this is a big deal. And so like this guy's got something different. He could actually move the needle and he's got a following we need to put them down. And we're going to see in the days to come that there were some pretty heavy-hitting Roman authorities that were in Jerusalem at the time that wouldn't have been there normally. They were there to keep peace and order. That's the atmosphere in which we're stepping in to read this story. It's electric with potential. Conflict, revolution, war. What's going to happen? Verse 3. Then Satan entered Judas called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Now, regularly as a preacher, I feel inadequate to explain context well enough that allows all of us to emotionally enter into the moment that we're reading. But you got, you got to understand here that, that this, was, this wasn't just any schmuck that had just started following Jesus a few weeks ago. This isn't like a fanboy, you know, fan club kid that Jesus didn't know. This is one of the 12. Out of all the tens of thousands of people Jesus could have selected, Jesus hand-selected this one and said, I want you to be one of the 12 that I'm going to serve, invest in, disciple, lead, nurture, encourage, equip, and raise up to send out. Judas is in on the in on the in. And for Judas to leave Team Jesus and go to the, to, to the other side, they're thinking like, this is incredible. We never thought we could have such a high-level asset inside the other team to use as a weapon against them to bring them down. This is incredible. This is, this is an intelligence boon. We have the guy that is the money guy, the treasurer guy, the guy that cuts all, all, all the checks for you know, the, the, uh, the, the food to buy all the stuff and the supplies. Like They trust him because they, they give him all the money of their little band. This guy has Jesus' ear. He's got the trust of all the disciples. And now he's in our pocket. This is amazing. And here's what I want you to consider as we talk about this issue of greatness is what was motivating Judas to do this? What, what, was, what was driving? Now, we know that, that Satan entered him, right? Satan entered him and, and, and moved him to do this. But I guess I'm stepping back from that and going, what, what, what was going on in Judas's heart to put him in a place where he would be vulnerable and open to Satan entering him and moving him to do such a horrible thing? And here's what I want to suggest. Because I don't think it was for money alone. Because they, they said they, they agreed 
to give him money. And, and, and that's certainly a part of it. But in other accounts in the gospel, we, we know the amount that was given. And it's not like they were giving him like $13 billion in stock options in Apple. It, it, this wasn't like generation money. This wasn't like legacy money. This wasn't like world-changing money. This was like a good salary. And so what would move Judas to, to act out such a heinous act of betrayal, even if he didn't like Jesus, but to betray him and hand him over to be murdered? I wonder, and this is just speculation on my part, I wonder if it's because Judas was angry. Judas was angry because Jesus was not going to deliver on Judas's expectations of greatness. I wonder if Judas had a definition of greatness that he realized Jesus wasn't going to meet and it caused him such disappointment and such disillusionment that he was now acting out in anger toward this man. I wonder if Judas had thought, hey, Jesus is going to institute a new government here. This is good. Jesus is going to become the new king. I can get behind that. Jesus is going to overthrow the current Roman government. I could be all about that. And if I'm with him and, in, and on the inside, as, as his stock goes up, my stock will probably go up. And there's a good chance once he's appointed, I've seen this happen before, when a new king is appointed, he needs to rely on men that have been with him for a while that he trusts to, of course, appoint to positions of high honor and power in his new kingdom. So if I can stay close enough here, there's a good chance there's a position of power in this for me. There's greatness in this for me if I stay with him long enough. And then I wonder if, Jesus, if Judas begins seeing the right on the wall, like, this is not going where I thought it was going to go. He's not going to do what I thought he was going to do. And I need to figure out which team I'm on because there's a good chance Jesus is going to end up dead. And we're all going to end up on trial for following him. And I've seen how Rome works. They're going to suppress this and put it down. And they will, uh, they will offer no quarter to those who are on this team. So I better back up and, qu and, and, and decide where my allegiance lies so I can position myself in the future to have influence and power. I wonder if Judas's wrong definition of greatness led him to step back, question Jesus, question this new kingdom of God he kept talking about, and decide I'm going to change teams in order to, to plan ahead to be on the winning team when this thing goes down and they either throw him in jail or kill him. Kill him. The point being is, Having a right definition of greatness is really important because if you don't have it, you might just open yourself up to the demonic to do something evil. A couple things we can learn from Judas. Number one, you can't lose what you don't have. The question with Judas is always, well, well, was he really saved? Was he really a Christian? Was he really a follower of Jesus? And how could he follow Jesus and then betray Jesus? And, and I just want to offer something for you to consider from John chapter 10, verse 21. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. This is Jesus. And they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Sometimes the question is asked, can you lose your salvation? It's a theological question that gets asked in terms of the nuances of how um, salvation works. So the study of soteriology, the, 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 the study of salvation, can you, can you lose your salvation? And I believe that the biblical answer is, is a, a resolute, a clear, a finished no. Jesus says here, how many sheep will Jesus lose? None. Like, there's no sheep that will be snatched from my hand. If I have my sheep, they will not be taken from me. That doesn't mean that wolves can walk in the sheep pen, walk around, pretend to be sheep, and then leave. This isn't a question of, oh, gosh, I can't believe Judas like, lost his salvation. This is simply him revealing that he never had true saving faith. You can't lose what you don't have. Second observation we learn from Judas is that you can be around Christ and not in Christ. You can be around Christ but not in Christ. Listen to how 1 John describes this, or I should say, rather, 
Um, John writes in 1 John, They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going out showed that none of them actually belonged to us. What's he saying? There were some people who had left the church and left Christianity. And people were like, what happened? Did they lose their salvation? Did they, were they really here and then decided not to be here? And John says, no, no, no. They, they, they went out from us, but they did not belong to us. They were around us for a while as the church, but they were not a part of the true church. What's he saying? He's saying you can be around Christ and not be in Christ. My parents were Christians. We grew up going to church. And, uh, well, that's great. Where are you with Jesus? Yeah, my wife, she reads the Bible all the time, and she's really spiritual. That's cool, bro. Where are you with Jesus? All my friends go to Grace City. We, we, we love anchors, a ton of fun. That's cool, dude. Where are you with Jesus? Because you can be around Jesus and not be in Jesus. Judas was around Jesus a lot. Jesus hung out with Jesus. He traveled with Jesus. He ate with Jesus. He laughed with Jesus. He preached and proclaimed Jesus. He went on mission trips for Jesus. Judas was, was, was actively around G Jesus. The problem was Judas wasn't in Christ, and Christ wasn't in Judas. He didn't have the Spirit of God living in him. He wasn't placing his faith in Jesus. He was using Jesus to leverage himself up for greatness that landed on and defined him. I want to be great, and I, want to, I think Jesus could help me be great. So I'm going, to, I'm going to go along with Jesus for a while. And isn't that like some of you? who have claimed to follow Jesus because of what he might get for you, you're, you're like, hey, like, like, if Jesus will help my finances get better, I'll follow Jesus. If Jesus will help my marriage get better, I'll follow Jesus. If Jesus will help my life circumstances kind of level out, I'll follow Jesus. And, and, and then you're around the church for a while, and you're around Jesus and his, and his bride, his people for a while, and you're like, my finances aren't getting better. My, my life's not getting better. It's actually gotten harder some ways. And I'm not sure if I want to do this thing. Friend, the problem is that you haven't tried Christ and found him wanting. The problem is you simply haven't yet fully tried Christ. You haven't died to yourself. You haven't said, okay, I'm done. He's it. I'm nothing. He's everything. I'm out. He's in. I want to be made new. So it's not as if when people leave the church and leave Jesus that they were saved and they were fellowshipping as sons and daughters of God and then he just like lost his sheep one day. They're proving that they were never truly in Christ to begin with in the first place. You can't unborn something that's been born. And Jesus defines Christianity as being born again. So if you've been born again, you can't unborn yourself. But you can pretend to be born again and then decide to leave later, which is what we see happening with Judas, which is a somber moment for us to reflect and you to reflect. Am I in Christ or have I just been around Christ? Because, brother, it's not enough for your, for your wife to be very godly. The question is, where are you at with Jesus? And it's not enough, young friend, for your parents to be passionate about the kingdom of God. The question is, are you in Christ yourself as a 15-year-old? Last thing we learn from Judas, I think a very instructive for us, is that Jesus knows the pain of betrayal. Jesus knows the pain of betrayal. And there are different kinds of pains and, and suffering that we endure here on earth. There's the physical pain and suffering of, 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 a, of a defect or an injury or bodies that get old and tired. There's, there's the emotional suffering that comes when we lose a lost one. I was on the phone with a dear brother this morning here at Grace City. He's just a tough mamma jamma. And he's just, he's just a tough dude. If like the chips were down and the zombie apocalypse was upon us, you, you'd like want this guy on your team, you know? Give him a full magazine and just start counting the bodies. I mean, this guy's a, this guy's a tough dude. And I was on the phone with him, and he, and he was weeping because one of his dear friends that he had participated as a member of, of, of the SWAT team in Seattle was uh, shot in the face this week and on life support, leaving a, a, a wife and a three-year-old son. Some dear friends of ours here, right here in our church family texted this morning. They, they, said, they said, long story, but Officer Dom is a huge part of our story and leading us to Jesus and connecting us in our world. We wouldn't be married without him. He was a godly man. We can't wait to tell you more about him. Don's with Jesus now. Succumbed to his injuries. He's dead. Leaves a widow, three-year-old son will never know his dad, and of course a hurting team and friends in the wake of his murder. 
That's, that's, that's a deep kind of suffering and pain. I'm, t- I'm tempted to say but, and I'll say and. And with that comes the knowledge that he, one, was a follower of Jesus Christ, two, had lived his life following Jesus, serving Jesus, and three, had given his life in the, in the noble endeavor of protecting our community from that which is evil. And so while the loss is massive and almost incalculable, and that the evil and injustice is real and great, there, there's comfort in the death knowing he's with Jesus and knowing that he gave his life in the noble pursuit of defending the freedoms that you and I enjoy and protecting us from evil that's out there that we wish to do harm. The pain of betrayal is a completely different kind of pain. There's never any resolve to it. You talk with a spouse who's been betrayed by a spouse, it's like a death, but that you never get over because the person who died is still alive, making your life miserable. It's a whole other level of emotional pain. When someone you love and is committed to you and and been there for you and you've been vulnerable with and open with and honest with and they, they know you closer than anyone else and then they take that knowledge and they wield it against you to hurt you and to harm you and they just do it relentlessly. I mean, some of the deepest pain I have experienced in my life as a pastor was witnessing the pain of betrayal. I'll never forget when Pastor Adam and Kent and I were with a family it was almost 20 years ago, and the dad had gone missing, and they didn't know where he was, and, and 24 hours go by, hadn't shown up at work in Seattle, 40 hours go by, hadn't shown up at work in Seattle, and now he's a missing person, and as time goes on, there's less and less chance he'll show up alive, and it's like, what happened? Is he kidnapped? Did he roll his car off the road? Is he, is he, is he lying, dying, or dead somewhere in a ditch? And so we were over at their home in East Wenatchee. He was a union worker in Seattle. We're over at their home in East Wenatchee. And Kent's with the wife, and Adam and I are with the kids, and, and you know, they're not eating, and family's over, and, 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 and it's just horrible. It's just, you try to eat food, but you're not hungry, and it's just this unknown of what's happened, and officers show up at the door, Mrs. So-and-so, are you the husband of a wife of so-and-so? Yes, I am. Uh, can we meet with you? Absolutely. Uh, so we divided up. Kent went with, with Becky down the hallway, into the room, and Adam and I stay with the kids. And there's just kind of like this, this low-grade mourning going on, the unknown. And then the officer proceeds to tell her that they found her husband, and he had committed suicide. And I'm telling you, to be in the room and to watch the, 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 the level of mourning spike, to go from grief and loss to what? Such a deep betrayal of love and relationship and, and like my dad killed himself my dad won't be there next year for my graduation my dad won't be there for and then you go to all my wedding and to walk me down the aisle or to be there when I graduate from the military academy and all these dreams that they had had together gone in a moment because they were betrayed by their father that's a deep kind of pain goosebumps as I talk about when I think about that moment of the kind of wailing that, it, that we experienced when it went from we think he's dead to he killed himself. Now I think about it, we had found out he was dead. That's why we were there. And then she found out he killed himself. And so they're grieving the death. And then, oh, it was suicide. Next level. There's something about betrayal that is so deep and painful. It, it, it's, an, it, it's a demonic assault on the human psyche. And, and, and I'm, 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 I'm wanting to highlight that for us because as we move toward the, the, the passion of Christ, the week of Christ where he is beaten and whipped and crucified, it, it's easy to, and rightly so, focus on the physical suffering of Jesus. That was significant, by the way. The physical suffering of Jesus, that was not small. It was, it was visceral. It was grotesque. It, it, it was existential. The pain was real. But it's easy to sometimes forget the emotional suffering that Jesus went through, like being betrayed by one of the men he deeply loved and had invested in. Jesus' suffering was total. It was physical, spiritual, relational, mental, emotional. And I tell you that by way of comfort. Because many of you have experienced betrayal, and then you wonder, where is God in this moment? And of course, 
There are, are, are many things we cannot know, but there is one clear answer we can always know, and that is whatever else God is doing in this moment where you've been unjustly betrayed, while we may not know what he's doing, we, we do know where he's at. He's with you in it. No other religion can claim that. No other, no other world teacher, no other God can claim that. Buddha's God, Muhammad's God, uh, uh, Islam, Islam's God. None other, no other God claims to identify with the suffering of their people like Jesus, the Son of God, who took on flesh and made himself accessible, hurtable, woundable, killable. Jesus is with you in your suffering because Jesus knew suffering. Jesus can identify you in your hurt because of betrayal because Jesus himself was betrayed by a closest friend. So we keep reading. Verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had been sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go ahead and make preparations for us to eat the Passover meal. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asked, where's the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, which is so cool, by the way. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Before I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. And they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. There's a lot happening there. Jesus is, of course, instituting communion as the new sacrament, as the new covenant renewal ceremony. He's saying, before, in this Holy Week, you remembered the spotless lamb that was slaughtered and the blood that was shed over the doorpost so that the angel of death might pass over. But in a few days, you'll celebrate God's spotless lamb who will give up a sacrifice once and for all to, to forgive all the sins of all the world. And if you, if you bring not your, just your household, but your personal life under the banner and blood of Jesus and are covered by his sacrifice, the judgment of God will pass over you and you will have eternal life. I'm going to give you a physical reminder of this reality so that whenever you gather, you can do this to celebrate and remember me and who you are and what I've done and your destiny. So there's a lot going on here. But imagine the relational dynamic Jesus infused into the moment when he told a really close group of guys that one of them is going to betray everyone else. <laughs> it's like, they're there hanging out. This is awesome. This is cool. We're, you know, we're like SEAL Team 6. We're Jesus' team. This is, we love this. Man, our God's going to kill it. Our King's going to reign. This is really kind of fun. I mean, he's healing the sick, raising the dead teaching the Bible, and people are following him, and now we're in Jerusalem, and something's going to happen. And Jesus is like, yeah, one of you is going to betray me, and we're all going to die. And they're like, they're like, well, you know, nice party. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine the dynamics changing? It's like, wait, 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 wait. Everything Jesus has said so far has come true. And he just said that one of us is going to betray him, and if one of us betrays him, then we're all going to buy the farm because we're all in with him. If Jesus goes down, we all go down. So that guy's not only betraying Jesus, he's betraying me. Is it you? And you're like, I don't think it's me. Is it you? I don't know, bro. I mean, can you imagine like the dynamic that would have caused? As they begin processing the fact that one of them would betray everyone else. 
Interesting to note, Jesus says this in one sentence. Of course, there have been systematic theology book, theological books written by the thousands of pages to solve this dilemma. Is God all sovereign or is man responsible for his decisions? Meaning, does God control all things? Therefore, obviously, we're not responsible for our decisions because they were predetermined for us. Or is God open to the future and we determine it by the choices that we make, thereby we are responsible for them because they're consequences? Jesus says the answer is yes. Look at the text. The Son of Man will go as it has been. What's the word? Thank you. There's one Bible open there. <laughs> the Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, meaning this has been a set, fixed event in time and space history. This is a sovereign, providential, predetermined event that God has prophesied in future past and is now even bringing about in real time this is going to happen, and woe to that man who betrays him. What's Jesus saying? I am sovereignly, providentially, powerfully, intentionally, and purposefully overseeing all things to my predetermined end, and each of you are responsible for the choices that you make and will stand before God for judgment. Now that's some tension, isn't it? We're like, well, how does that work? <laughs> Just because your pea brain can't grasp it doesn't make it any less true. And so we take hope and comfort in the fact that God's purposes are sure and secure. There is no uncertainty for the people of God following him. And your life matters and the decisions you make matter. And you will be held accountable for the decisions that you make. It's a mouthful, isn't it? Now we're going to turn our attention to verse 24 that introduces the dumbest argument in the history of recorded humanity. <laughs> because just moments prior, Jesus gave this incredible speech about his body and the bread and the broken and the blood and the covenant and the Passover and the thing and the stuff and the, and the whatever. And then, oh, by the way, one of you is going to betray the other, so you all probably lose your life in the service of me. Like, there's a lot on the table. And in minutes, listen to what these clowns are talking about. Verse 24, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. <laughs> these guys are awesome. <laughs> Jesus picked these clowns to follow him so that you and I would read them 2,000 years later and go, well, well, I guess I can be on the team too. <laughs> I mean, because they're like... If, if these guys help start the church, then, then, then maybe there's hope I can participate as well. They go from this serious conversation about messianic fulfillment and promises fulfilled and the Son of God on the cross dying for the sins of the world and this massive theological tension of the providence and sovereignty of God and the responsibility of mankind and the fact that one of them is going to betray themselves to I'm greater than you. No, I'm greater than you. Oh, I was here first. He likes me more. He always hangs out with me. He told me one time he thought you were a schmuck. He did not say that. Jesus doesn't say schmuck. Well, he said something. Might be like, like, what are you talking about? And like, if I was Jesus, I would have been like, guys, what are you talking about? We're arguing over who is the greatest. Okay. How many of you here were born of a virgin? I win. Pass the wine. You know what I mean? It's like, this is like, why are we really talking about this, guys? Jesus takes a deep breath, and then in 60 seconds, redefines greatness forever. Look what he says. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. It is what? Power, position, authority. The kings of the Gentiles lord their power over the Gentiles, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. What's he saying? Jesus is going to teach us several things on greatness. The first thing he's saying is this. Worldly leaders step on others to elevate themselves. Godly leaders lay down themselves to elevate others. He's saying, here's how the kings of the Gentiles exercise their authority. And I want you to know that Jesus never once is negative towards influence, authority, power, or greatness. Jesus never once knocks 
Greatness, because God is great. And if we're to be like God, there must be something inherently good about greatness. God is all powerful. Jesus was all powerful. And we're to be like Jesus. And so there must be something inherently great about power. He's never going to knock greatness or power. What he's going to address is the motivation for being great, the motivation for having power, and then what you do with it. And so he says here, worldly leaders, they pursue greatness to promote their own name, and they pursue power so they can wield it in the pushing of other people down. Godly greatness, true, true greatness, godly leaders rather lay their own lives down so they can build up and elevate others like I will do in a few days when I lay my life down in the service of you. He's redefining greatness, not as the climbing of the ladder to gain power, but as the using of the power God brings to serve other people sacrificially. But he's not done. Lesson number two, true greatness starts with a fundamental orientation towards others. Look at the text, verse 26. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? He's saying, by the world standards, if, if there's a table full of kings and they're being served by servants making minimum wage, which one does the world say is greater? Well, of the one, the table being served. That's a mark of greatness that you have the money to hire people to serve you. And Jesus says, but I am among you as one who serves. He's saying, if the definition of greatness is the guy who's got the money to hire people to serve him, that can't make sense because Jesus is coming in the posture of a servant and Jesus is the greatest, which must mean there, there's a a different definition of true greatness. Jesus is the greatest person to walk the planet. Jesus is the greatest man in the history of mankind. And he came not in the posture of a king to, to step on people and be served by people. He came in the posture of a servant himself, redefining greatness. It starts with a fundamental orientation towards others, which means any definition or experience of greatness you pursue that does not have others as its end or another's name as its motive, it is not true greatness. It's worldly greatness. It's cheap greatness. It's short-sighted greatness. It's greatness that has an expiration date on it, namely when you die. But there's a kind of greatness that can outlast your name if you live your life for a higher name. Lesson number three we learn from Jesus about greatness. Worldly greatness fixates inward. True greatness focuses outward. And I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. What's he saying? Worldly greatness focuses on me and what I can get from myself, true greatness focuses on others and what I can do in the service of other people. He, he's trying to fundamentally reorient the focus of their life so they can experience true greatness. Lesson number four, we see self-purpose spoils ambition. Kingdom person redeems ambition. Jesus is saying here, I'm going to give you, I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred upon me. And then verse 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as of wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have returned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus is giving Peter, the opportunity to live his life for something bigger than himself and in so doing, redeeming greatness. It's not that God doesn't want... It's, it's, it's a trick question, right? Do you want to be great? Well, I'm supposed to be humble, so uh, no. Okay, does that mean you, you don't want a great marriage? Well, I'm supposed to be a good husband. Uh, yes, I want a great marriage. Like, wh what's the answer? No, do you want a great marriage? Yes, you should want a great marriage. Do you want great kids? Yes, you should want to raise, raise great kids. Do you want to lead a great business? Absolutely. Christians should start, own, and run the greatest businesses in the world because we're infusing kingdom principles into them. And guess what? Kingdom principles work. 
They restore culture. They, they bring a, a sense of, of life-giving ethos wherever they go. It's generous. It's sacrificial. It's hardworking. It's honest. It's integrity. Had a chance to sit down with the mayor this last week and listen to him talk to our vector students. And, 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 and in my estimation, he's an extraordinary man. We're lucky to have him in, 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 in our town. And, and he, he has a fundamental orientation to serve other people. And he wakes up and he wants to serve and he wants to help. And he was talking about this fact that, that we, only, we only have so many police officers uh, on any given shift. And on any given time, there can be 40,000 people in the, in the city of Wenatchee and only four to six officers on duty at any time, which means there's not enough manpower to suppress all the crimes. So the only way you can have order is to work on the other side of the equation, which is to grow the population of people who don't break the law and want to serve the good of our community. And I thought, hey, that's our job. We're helping the police department out here by helping more people want to live in such a way that the police aren't needed. Right? Amen. And as we began talking about this, I thought, my goodness sakes, self-purpose spoils ambition, kingdom purpose redeems ambition. When you, when you, when you lead a business in such a way that has kingdom purposes inside of it, you're, you're taking a risk to create work for people and income for people and a way for people to, to not throw their life away in front of the TV, taking the government handout, but experience the, the dignity of working hard and being compensated for that and providing for their family. And the more businesses that are started and infused with kingdom values, the more people flourish and the more community grows. Kingdom principles work. God isn't against ambition. He's not against greatness. He's not against pursuing excellence. He's against you doing those things to promote your own name. He's saying, he's, he's saying, you better have the best business in town because I told you to do all that you do with all of your might for the glory of my name. We don't mail things in. We don't give half-hearted effort. There's no half-hearted effort in the kingdom of God. Whatever your hand finds you to do, do it with all of your might, God says. And that will lead many of you to do things of excellence because you care about the standard of your behavior, not because of what it how it makes you look, but how it makes God look. I'm representing Jesus. Therefore, we're not going to mail this in. Therefore, I'm going to live with integrity. Therefore, I'm going to be honest. Therefore, I'm going to work hard. Therefore, I'm going to give my boss an honest effort. I'm going to show up a little early. I'm going to stay a little late. And, 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 and between the goalposts, I'm going to outwork anybody else there. I'm going to be the best good news he's heard. And one day, if he wants to know about Jesus, I'll tell him why I'm the best good news he's heard, because I follow Jesus. Self-purpose spoils ambition. Living for myself, yuck. Kingdom person redeems ambition. Get after it. Fifth lesson we learn. True greatness is self-forgetfulness in the glad and happy service of another. Look at this text, verse 33. But Peter replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Don't you love Peter? Just all heart, you know what I mean? Verse 34. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter... Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. A friend pointed out the difference between the use of the word betrayal and denial. Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter denied Jesus. Not the same. One is deep and, and reveals the, 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 the idolatrous posture of the heart. The, the other was an act of um, non-faith, maybe rooted in fear, which is why I say true greatness is self-forgetfulness and the glad and happy service of another. If you were to ask me why Peter betrayed Jesus, or excuse me, denied Jesus, he'd followed Jesus, he'd been the most loud, outspoken uh, uh, disciple of Jesus, he cut a guy's ears off for Jesus. I mean, this was like bold, rash, impetuous, gotta love the heart Peter guy. And then he gets put on the spot and he denies Jesus. And I think it was because Peter had a flash of embarrassment or a flash of fear of man and thought, my goodness sakes, he gets put on the spot in a group of guys by a junior high girl who says, weren't you seen with Jesus? And, and, and a self-conscientiousness, a self-consciousness overcomes Peter and he's like, uh, uh, no, no, that wasn't me. Wrong guy, wrong guy, wrong guy. You can't be faithful to following Jesus in the path of greatness when you're plagued with self-consciousness. Just always aware of yourself, always embarrassed of what you might say, always con conscientious of what people think about you. There, there is a kind of reckless abandon to caring what only Jesus thinks about you that frees you to actually follow him. 
that will cripple you if you're constantly worried about what the world thinks. Now, I'm not saying you don't care about what godly counsel say, thinks and what your friends think because, because that's recklessness and that's lone rangerness and that's, that'll lead you into foolishness and stupidity. So I'm not saying that. I'm following Jesus. I don't care what people say, even though they all think this is crazy. Well, okay, let's talk about it. Maybe, maybe not. But what, I, what I'm not saying is, is you can't walk through life. Should you care about your reputation? Yes and no. You can't be an elder in the church unless you have a good reputation among, among the, the community. So you've got to care about it a little bit. But not the sense that you care about it because of how people think about you, but you care about it because of how it makes God look. See the difference? I care about my, my reputation to the degree that it's faithfully representing God. And if I have a bad reputation because people who hate God are accusing me, then I can't do anything about that. But if I act foolishly and stupidly and angrily and in the flesh and not in the spirit, and that's the reason I have a bad reputation, I can fix that. That's on me, and I start with repentance. Friend, do you struggle with, are you plagued with self, just, just, uh, just it's overwhelming self-awareness all the time? What I'm wearing, what I'm dressing, how I'm being perceived. I got a phrase it just right on social media. Ooh, I got, you know, you're just, just plagued by what other people think. You'll be crippled to live a great life. Because you're fixated on self, not God. When your focus is consumed with how people might perceive you, and therein your stock may go up or down, because you fear what man thinks, not God thinks, you are incapable of living a truly great life. Last lesson. True greatness is bold enough to get into trouble for the glory of one name. I love this. Look at verse 35. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Of course, he's referencing when he sent them out a few chapters ago on their first missionary endeavor. Remember he said, don't take any clothes, don't take a bag, don't take supplies. I will meet your needs as they arise. And they're like, okay, this is crazy. And they went out and, and it happened. He was doing that to demonstrate to them that he's trustworthy and he'll provide for their need. But it wasn't like, it wasn't, it was descriptive, not prescriptive. It was describing a specific moment in salvation history. It wasn't prescribing how we should always view missionary endeavors. I'm just going to go to Papua New Guinea. No plan, no preparation, no job, no income. Just going to trust the Lord. Well, keep reading because that's not how Jesus sent him out the next time. Look at what it says here. Remember how I sent you out lacking nothing? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you, if you have a purse, take it. Now if you have a bag, Take it. And if you have a sword, sell your cloak. Excuse me. If you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. So you didn't know Jesus supported the Second Amendment, did you? He's a huge Second Amendment fan. <laughs> I love my church. This is awesome. <laughs> I love you guys. Sell your cloak and buy a weapon. And if they make the, the long mag sword illegal, buy four of them. <laughs> That's in the Greek. That's in the Greek. <laughs> like your pastor. Verse 37, it is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. And Jesus says, rock on. <laughs> he's pro weapons and defending themselves because he's like, you know what? I'm going to go to the cross, and I'm going to die for the sins of the world. I'll raise to life on the third day, and then I'll send you out like sheep among wolves, and it's going to get sporty. So make a plan and get ready. There's nothing inherently and unholy about stepping out into the unknown unprepared. I use it as an example to build faith in you towards me, and now prepare yourself because it's going to get sporty. True greatness is bold enough to get in trouble for Jesus' name. If you're not getting shot at somewhere in your life, you should wonder if you're faithfully following Jesus. Especially in our culture today. And I'm not saying seek it. I'm not saying intentionally poke the bear so it comes. But I am saying as our increasingly post-Christian culture runs away from Jesus, what used to be seen as noble and laudable in moral lifestyles will be increasingly seen 
as crazy and insane and hateful and bigoted and will be attacked. So it's not like we're out there picking fights. All we're doing is just like, it's, it's like, I haven't moved. You weren't yelling at me yesterday. Now you're yelling at me. Who changed, me or you? I'm still doing my thing, saying my thing, following my God. This, and, and, and now I'm a what? This is weird. Did I change or the culture change? As the culture changes, you staying in your Jesus place will bring increased hostility. That's okay. Have enough panache to get in trouble for Jesus' sake. And I'm not saying we seek it or look forward to it. Again, I don't, I don't like getting shot at. Like, no one's like, they're shooting at us. We're really living now. I mean, like, no one thinks that, right? It's like, I hope I had a chance to use this sword. Come on. I mean, like, okay, maybe in, like, the warrior moment. But most of the time, like, like, I'm a peace-loving guy. We all want to live in peace, right? Let's like, leave me alone. That's the T-shirt ad I wanted to print the last two years. Hashtag freaking leave me alone. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just you stay on that side of the state. I'll stay over here and stay behind your desk and I'll live in my life and just leave me alone. Just stop bugging me. Anybody want that t-shirt? We print them up. You know, Gray State Church, leave us alone. It's like, my gosh. We'll edit all that out. Maybe not. Maybe not. We'll... You just, you just get your hands off me. You know anybody felt like that? Last couple just, 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 I'm a grown adult. I'll figure it out. Like, if I, if I fall off my bike, hit my head, and die, that's on me. I won't sue you. Don't worry about it. Don't tell me I got, oh, we're going down the wrong road here. Anyways, <laughs> you should read the book Three Felonies a Day. It'll ruin you. It'll just drive you crazy. Every American commits three felonies a week. They don't even know it. There's so many rules and regulations in our country nowadays. It's crazy. It's wrong. It's bad. It positions people in power to pull the rug on people that they want to. So they let you go on and break laws because it doesn't bother them. But when they want you, boom, they can pull it. Now you're a lawbreaker. Bad news, folks. We've got to keep up, use our heads. Anyways, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. <laughs> True greatness is bold enough to get in trouble for the glory of Jesus' name. It's like, it's like true greatness isn't found in running and hiding and cowering. Amen. Jesus is like, if you're going to follow me, it's going to get sporty. So like, go get your cup and strap on. <laughs> this isn't getting any better, is it? This is... <laughs> This is more like a Thursday night sermon than a Sunday. I typically work this stuff out on Thursday nights. My bad. You get the point. Do you? No. I'm just glad my mom was in first service. That's all I'm saying right now. I'm just begging you to, to erase this sermon after we finish here. Because she'll watch it this week, and then I won't get any cookies. Okay. Let's see if we can land a plane. Two big ideas. Number one. Jesus doesn't rebuke their desire for greatness. He redirects it. Jesus doesn't say, whoa, 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 whoa. If you're going to follow me, you need, you need to have less energy. You need to have less drive, less motivation. I'm looking for mediocrity here. I'm looking for kind of half-hearted, milk-toast effort. I'm looking for robots and yes-men. Just kind of cool the jets and calm down and just kind of come in about a solid B-. minus. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, your problem is not that you desire too, too much, but too little. You want a, a position of power the world can give when I'm offering a position of influence that I can give. You want glory from an earthly king. I'm willing to invite you into participating in the glory of a galactic king. Don't tone things down. Ramp them up. Don't desire less. Desire more. Don't stop pursuing greatness. Start pursuing true greatness, which he redefines as a life of service and sacrifice for the good of others and the glory of his name. Jesus doesn't rebuke their desire for greatness. He redirects it so as to amplify it. It's like Jesus doesn't squelch our desire for sexuality, he redirects it into the covenant of marriage so we can experience it as he intended. He doesn't say, stop eating food, it's bad for you. Though I made it, you should want it, but don't turn to it as a false idol for comfort and on down the list of gifts. God gives us kids. God doesn't say, love your kids less. He says, love them more by directing them to me and refusing to worship them as a God. Don't love your kids less. Love me more so that you don't get your identity from them and crush them with expectations. 
The answer is never to love less. The answer is always to love the right thing more. Jesus is here saying, I'm not, I'm not against greatness. I'm all about greatness. In fact, I am pretty great myself. I want you to experience true greatness, not worldly greatness. Lesson number two, big idea. Jesus draws straight lines with crooked sticks. And the band can come out on stage as we prepare for communion. Here's the big idea. Don't think that what it takes to be great in God's kingdom is you bring a perfect resume to the table and then God says, I've been waiting for you to show up. Finally, someone who has their act together, now I can get something done in my kingdom. Look at the story. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back to me, strengthen your brothers. Do you get what's happening there? He's saying, here's the deal, Peter. I know you're all heart, but I know also what's going to happen. You're going to deny me for a time. You're going to run away from me for a while. But when you turn back to me, I'm going to give you a job, and that is to build the church. It's a remarkable prophetic reinstatement of Peter after he's going to make a colossal mistake in denying Jesus three times. And what I want you to hear is this, that there is no mistake you've made that God can't redeem and put you back on his team for his glory. What we're tempted to think is, well, I really screwed up now, and so now I can't be used of God. Hey, Sometimes your screw up has, has consequences in the real world because you broke a law and, 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 and those consequences have to stand. That does not mean that God cannot use you wherever he, those consequences take you. I've met man after man after man after man who's failed to lead their marriage for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and they have a spiritual awakening to God and their eyes are open and their heart is tender and their, their hands want to actually serve rather than take for the first time in their life. And six months in, they're defeated because they feel like they have no right to walk in the blood-bought authority of Jesus to lead their home. And I have lost track of how many defeated men I've, I, I, I've had to get down and, hey, hey, look up, look up, hey. What, you think I lead my home because of my resume I brought to the table? You think I take up my place as head in my home over my kids and over my wife to lead them and to love them and to serve them in Jesus' name because of my perfect resume? I wake up every day and I put my gospel boots on and I say, I'm going to lead today not because I deserve it, but because I've been assigned it. I'm going to lead today not because I'm perfect, but because he is perfect. I'm going to lead today not because I have earned it, but because he's charged me to do it. I'm going to lead today not because of my perfect resume, but because I'm going to walk in the blood, bought, power, and authority of Jesus Christ as a forgiven son, obeying the wishes of his master, living a life of greatness as I get low to build and serve others up. That's how you do it. And I'm, I'm, I'm jealous for the church not to get hung up in the past stuff. And hear me, it's a big deal. If you've screwed up and sinned, it's a big deal. And there should be a sense of holy fear and trembling that falls on the house of God for treating holy things lightly and for treating our sexuality as if it's our own and for taking things from others that we, they cannot get back and for being selfish with our time and our talents. Like all that, yes, fall in trembling and, and trepidation before a holy God and then stand up a forgiven sinner and walk in the sainthood Jesus gives you. Because if you, if you slide over to like self-flagellation and just whip myself and beat myself and oh, God could never love me, you're insulting the blood of Jesus. You're insulting the power of Jesus to rescue and redeem a broken sinner and put them back on the path to strengthen the hands of the brethren. I think Jesus decided to use Peter to demonstrate globally that he regularly uses crooked sticks to draw straight lines. I had, I, you, you do this long enough and, and, and people feel free sometimes to tell you what they think about you, which is great. And, and I've had people come to tell me, you suck at this, or you suck at this, or you're not good at that. And to which I, I stopped being defensive because I realized I agree with them. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm like, I'm, totally, bro, if you only knew. 
the list I have. That you're, you're not, you, you hit number three. I got 17. I don't get defensive anymore. It's, it's, it's like, I know, isn't it crazy? Isn't it crazy? I could suck at that and suck at that and suck at that. And somehow, God still does something. He must be in the business of drawing straight lines with crooked sticks. Which means there's hope for all the crooked sticks in the room. There's hope for the broken. There's hope for the screwed up. There's hope for those who have fallen short. True greatness is available for anyone and everyone. Not because of who we are, but because of what he's done. And I'm telling you, one of the greatest gifts the gospel brings is the gift of self-forgetfulness. Not only do you forget living for your glory, you forget that you don't even deserve to be there in the first place. You forget that, that all, all of your sin should cause God to rage against you in righteous judgment, and yet he has chosen the scandalous option of forgiving you by punishing his perfect son. He's like, <laughs> This is amazing. And then you should rise and what Paul say, God's grace to me will not be in vain. I will run harder and work harder and strive harder than all the rest because his grace to me will not be wasted. Not to earn it, but to demonstrate a proper response to it. This is amazing. I'm overwhelmed. Thanks be to God. Let my name be forgotten and his name endure forever. That's the cry of the Christian. We're going to run hard. There's no name on this building. Have you noticed that? You know? You know? The McPherson Community Hall. Like, puke. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yuck. James Hub. You know? McMullen Chapel. Nobody's here in this for, 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 for a name. One name. I want to run hard live like my hair's on fire, move the needle, die and be forgotten, and join the saints in glorifying one name for eternity. Jesus draws straight lines with crooked sticks. So as we move to a time of reflection and preparation for communion, I want to give you a few questions. You can bow your heads with me if you'd like. And just a few questions for you to reflect upon as we approach the, the communion table. Question number one, to assess true greatness, do you gladly allow Jesus to serve you? Because you can't get into the kingdom unless you allow Jesus to serve you. There's a false humility that would say, no, 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 Jesus, don't serve me. And Jesus would say, no, if I don't serve you, like, you don't get in. Okay, okay, serve me. And every time we come to the communion table, we're reminded again, friends, that Jesus served us by giving his life for us in our place. So do you gladly allow Jesus to serve you? Every week you should come wanting to offer a, an offering of praise and also longing to be served by Christ in ways that only he can serve you, in meeting needs that only he can meet. Secondly, do you humbly allow others to serve you? I want you to think about this. Some of you are hard to be married to because you don't allow your spouse to serve you. No, 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 I got it, I got it, I got it. And you put off an air that says, I don't need any help. And that's not humility, that's actually pride. Some of the humblest people I know are the best at receiving gifts of service because they recognize that it's a good thing to allow others to serve and use their gifts to bless Jesus, even when you're the recipient of it. Do you allow others to easily serve you or are you defensive and prideful? Three, is your first instinct to find ways to serve wherever you go? been in this business long enough to know there are only two kinds of people that show up at a church. Those that show up to serve and those that show up to take. There's no other category. Sometimes their service looks like asking questions. I, I want to discover what's going on. Okay, great. Let, 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 let's get some questions answered. But there's a fundamental posture underneath a person's heart. I'm coming to take or I'm coming to give. Where is that? Where are you at in that continuum? Number four, are you willing to do menial tasks? What a great test of the heart. 
I want to serve Jesus and be great. Awesome. We got some toilet stain cleaning. That's not what I had in mind. I have the spiritual gift of not cleaning toilets. What I love about our team and our door holders is I regularly find them doing things that isn't their job because they see it needing done. And nobody here at this church is, is above and beyond doing anything. Yes, get in your lane. Yes, use your gifts. Yes, let's get everybody in an effective position. And yes, everyone is, should be willing to do everything because nobody's above doing anything. If Jesus is willing to die for you, you can sweep the floor. We, we have doctors, attorneys, lawyers, sophisticated, successful businessmen who I walk in on, on, on a weekday who are sweeping the floors of this church, and I love it. Because it's a heart that says, I'm here to serve. What can I do? Question five, are you a giver or a taker? Question six, would you rather make a difference and go unnoticed or achieve status and attention? And question number seven, where are, you, are areas that you need help on the selfish to servant continuum? And I think there are different categories of life you should think in because we're not always doing great in all the same ways. Like, oh, I'm doing really good at church. I'm serving a lot at church. I'm just ignoring the needs of my spouse and my family. Okay, well, let's figure it out, bro. I'm really good at serving my family, but we're pretty inward focused and we don't want to serve too much of the church. Well, don't torpedo your family by teaching them to not be an active part of the church. Well, I'm really good at serving my, my team because that's fun, but when I get home, you know, the chores, that's just kind of beyond me. Okay, sweetheart, let's work on doing the chores at home to be a blessing to your mom and dad so you can, be, you can grow as a servant everywhere. How you doing on, this, on, the, on the selfish to servant continuum in the different areas of your life? And so, Father, we're coming to you in preparing our heart to take communion. And we want to be both ruined by you and wrecked by you and raised by you. We want to be ruined by you so that we see our sin for what it is and feel rightly and deeply the offense it is to you. And then we want to be raised by you to newness of life that we could stand up and in the confidence that comes by being a blood-bought son or daughter of Jesus, take a step towards greatness this afternoon. Lord, would you work it so that this house would be a house full of servants whose fundamental, fundamental orientation is toward the sacrificial service of others in their home, in their place of employment, and here in this church family. That you would equip our hands and move our hearts and awaken our minds so that we would see what true greatness is and we would pursue it with all of our might and that 2,000 people would, would leave church this weekend with a fire in their belly to leave it all in the field, to refuse to mail it in again, and to strive towards greatness in every area of their life as a humble servant of God. Thank you, Father, for the profound example we have in the Son of Jesus Christ, the greatest man to walk the planet, who laid his life down in the service of others. And would you move us in the witnessing of that example and the partaking of that example this morning through communion, would you move our hearts towards greatness as we would look to lay down our own agendas and pick up your kingdom, to lay down our own purpose and have your kingdom infuse us with new meaning and new goals and a new agenda and a new life vision and new aspirations that our ambitions would not be marked by self-centeredness, but would be marked by holiness. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen.